I'm Harry, your host at the Episteme Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to science and tech startups that will change our lives. It's a pleasure to welcome Rodolphe Besser, CEO at Euricare, one of the most impressive life science startup studios in Europe. Euricare was launched in July 2021 uh, in Brussels and Paris, uh, backed by 50 million euros uh, from uh, private funding. Nice to have you, sir. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you, Ari. Nice to uh, to talk to you and uh, happy to uh, to join this uh, this podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. It's very precious to have you because what you do for the startup ecosystem is precious, and it's having you today is very important. Um, this interview will be in two parts. Uh, the first part we'll talk about a little bit about yourself, uh, from a, um, a chemist engineer to the finance world, and then we'll talk about your role as a CEO of Euricare. Uh, do you agree? Yeah, that's perfect. Great. Thank you. So uh, could you uh, please uh, present your path from the freshly uh, graduate you uh, in chemical uh, engineering into the finance world? Um, yeah, so um, I, was, uh, I was graduated actually from the School of Chemistry of Lyon in France in a uh, long time ago now, 1996. Uh, I actually did a sandwich year uh, before, before that in the UK uh, between my, my second and my, and my third year. Uh, on the European R&D site uh, of Dow AgroSciences uh, in one touch close to Oxford in the UK. And that was a very exciting year. Actually, I was young and uh, it was amazing to be abroad. It was a good experience also in the lab. Uh, I was, uh, was working on, on the formulation of pesticides in a highly skilled team, working notably on, on cutting edge uh, technology at that time, uh, like uh, micro encapsulation, for instance. Uh, I was specialized in, uh, in, in analytical chemistry. I, I learned a lot during this year. And, uh, and then I spent my final year uh, at the University of Karlsruhe in Germany uh, with a specialization in water chemistry. So very uh, international profile, I would say. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, but the conclusion also was that I was not sure at the end that I was ready to, to spend the, the the, the, the bulk of my life in a, in, a, in a lab. I enjoyed it, but maybe it was not for me. So after that, I, 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 I did a business school, uh, which probably provided me with uh, additional uh, feelings and uh, uh, which led to this career in, in finance after that, yeah. And uh, in the business school, did you specialize in, in corporate finance, in the, in the stock market, or, or it was it some, how was, uh, I mean, your, your, because it was the, the first step to the, you know, to, to the finance world, the business school. Yeah, actually, after, the, after my, uh, my, my year in Germany, I did my military service uh, as officer in French Signals uh, Regiment in, uh, in France. And also that was, a, I have to say, a great experience on the human and management side. Uh, I, I was actually uh, quite close, tempted to, to stay in the army. Uh, my, my regiment was actually... Uh, very active and, and present uh, at that time in, in former Yugoslavia. But, you know, after uh, 18 months in the army, I eventually decided to, uh, to come to, uh, to, to civil life. So I, I did business school in, uh, in Lyon, it was two years. Uh, and at that time I had actually a very clear uh, professional objective, uh, which was based on my, on my previous experience. And this was to develop actually turnkey sewage uh, processing uh, stations in Asia. So you can see that it was <laughs> very precise. I, I had that in, in mind, actually, when I joined the, the business school. Uh, and, uh, but in reality, I, I have to admit that after uh, two, three months, I, I discovered a new field uh, I, I didn't know before. And uh, I really fell in love with, which was uh, finance and, and in particular market finance. So uh, I, I, we had the choice, you know, to, um, to uh, sort of cours à la carte, and uh, I, chose, I chose at that time a lot of uh, uh, course in, uh, in finance, and, uh, and then I did my internship, actually, on a trading floor uh, in, a, in a small brokerage house, and it was a, a great time, you know, it was the end of the 90s, uh, so still sort of golden age uh, for, this, uh, for this business, I love it, and Actually, one year after, I started working for this company uh, as a researcher. And so totally changed my, my, my professional uh, career or what I had in mind when I joined the business school. 
And I started as research analyst actually covering the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, and I never uh, regretted it. Since, uh, I think research analyst is, is a really exciting uh, job. Uh, you, you know, you interact with uh, uh, companies, you develop your own view on, on those companies and you try to convince salespeople and asset managers uh, to buy your ideas. So I, I'm, I really like it. And uh, I exercised this, this profession actually for about 12 years. So covering big pharmas, mid cap pharmas, and then the biotech sector when I joined actually Société Générale in, in 2005. And you, you did great because I read that you have a, um, you have a ranked number one uh, analyst in France, right? Uh, in, in the sector. Yeah, no, it's true. I think it, it, I think it was ranked uh, number one in 2010. Uh, so for any sector, so amongst wow. I mean, 250 analysts, I was number one uh, probably by, by chance also. Mm -hmm. Of, uh, some of the recommendations I made at that time, um, uh, the, the market was very volatile. So I had a chance, and uh, as I made good recommendations, I had the chance to have a, to have a huge uh, performance on, on those stocks. And so, yes, uh, I was elected first in, in France, but that was for one year. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it was quite, uh, quite funny. But definitely, I. Uh, I enjoyed this, uh, this, this, this job, which is now is a little bit different. I think it's probably uh, uh, less exciting than it was uh, at that time. But um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a good way to, uh, to learn about the sector, to uh, understand the sector, the logics uh, with, uh, let's say, the big companies and the smaller companies. And, and particularly when I started covering biotech, I think it was... Uh, It was great since I, I, I really looked at uh, on, on the, on the R&D side of, uh, of the picture. And uh, yes, that was a very good uh, training also. It's very interesting with your, with your background and, uh, and journey, you know, through the finance that you are a kind of professional that understand pharma, biopharmaceutical company from, you know, the, uh, the listed one to the pre-IPO to, and now with the, with the, um, With the T0, you know, of the of the launching of such venture, particular venture, because they are not like others, you know, you know they are very particular uh, venture. They have their own business model. They have their own regulation. So now, uh, this is very interesting to see that you have this kind of profile that can uh, have this vision from T0 to the post IPO, and this is great. Um, then you join in Société Générale and you perform it. Um, you conducted more than 50 transnational deals, including IPO, right issues, mergers, LPO, but all of these uh, experience were in the pharma, biopharma sector, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And actually, again, I think the switch to the, to the biotech sector uh, was a real turning point for me. Uh, and uh, it was in 2005. So the, the sector was really emerging at that time in France. Uh, there were only three uh, listed companies. And actually, I had the chance to, uh, to start covering uh, also uh, many European uh, biotech companies from the UK, Germany, Switzerland, and so on. So uh, that's really how I discovered innovation, I have to say, since before that, uh, with pharma, <laughs> with pharma uh, was the bulk of the story were, were really defensive, uh, notably for the protection of their franchise against generic companies. And with the biotech sector, I really deepen my, my R&D knowledge. And as you say, after a, a couple of years, I had also the chance or the opportunity uh, to, uh, to switch to, to become banker, actually, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the group. I'm in charge of, uh, of the sector, so at Société Générale. And I actually created this practice. Uh, and I think it was a perfect timing. So in 2010, and we, we were very successful. So we've... Uh, more than 30 IPOs, uh, a lot of uh, various uh, tra transactions in the fields, not, on, not only in France, but also in, uh, in the rest of Europe and a couple of deals actually on the NASDAQ as well. So I have to say I had, I had 10 fabulous years uh, and, and actually uh, over the last three years between 2017 and 2020, uh, my, role, my role was enlarged uh, to all startup fields So not only healthcare, but also covering IT, fintech, green tech, which 
was great since uh, it really opened my my chakra as we say i discovered also many uh, many uh, uh, new things uh, outside healthcare and and then came uh, uh, what is probably the project of my life <laughs> which is the creation of eureka so in association with uh, two family offices in, in 2020 so perfect transition now la now let's talk about the the, this, this amazing structure uh, venture, Eureka, because um, uh, the mission of Eureka is very bold and, and very important for the humankind. I, I'm not scared to, to, to tell it like, uh, like this. Um, so um, in entrepreneurship, you know, we are used to say that there is, when, when there is a societal problem somewhere, there is a space for a startup to, to bring a solution. So what was the societal problem that you identify uh, and Eureka would be a great solution for that. So, in fact, when we uh, when we decided to to launch Eureka, so we had a lot of uh, brainstorming. So it was at the end of 2020, and we were in this uh, particular, of course, context of the, of the COVID uh, crisis. But I think there were two main uh, motivations uh, to create this structure. First, uh, bring uh, the new kinds of investors. Uh, to finance early stage uh, projects in the biotech field. And uh, it's one of the principal issues I met myself as a banker. So, I mean, the lack of uh, dedicated biotech funds uh, or biotech investors uh, in Europe when you compare it with the, with the US. So that was, I think, the first, uh, the first reason. And the, the second motivation uh, was to uh, better exploit uh, the European academic research. Well, I think we had the feeling that there are great things in, in European research, which is well financed uh, in, in very early stage, uh, thanks to a lot of uh, very, very deep public, uh, public support. But this research can hardly, uh, hardly find uh, bridge financing uh, to go to the proof of concept. And uh, uh, I, I would say it's uh, essentially due to the fact, to, 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 to the lack of dedicated uh, uh, structures um, and uh, particularly in, in a context where industrial companies and pharma companies in, in particular are, are very far from uh, fundamental research and really concentrate on late stage uh, projects and, and, and marketing of, of products. So I think when you look at COVID crisis and the, the, the development of uh, mRNA vaccines, uh, all this has shown that uh, uh, many innovations actually were originated from Europe, uh, but were eventually developed and exploited in the US. So uh, this is what we wanted to, to tackle with Eureka, so really to, to be able to, you know, to, to finance in this uh, very specific moment where you are transiting from uh, uh, the, the, the fundamental research to the proof of concepts, and where we know it's very difficult for projects or for new ventures uh, to find uh, uh, financing. So, um, and why did you choose the startup studio model? It could have been, I don't know, maybe we could have launched a VC, uh, uh, an incubator or, or funding, you know, and, and, and establish accelerator. Why the startup studio in particular? Why, 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 why this solution was obvious that was the perfect solution? It was not uh, obvious at the beginning, but uh, I think uh, my uh, my financial partners, you know, are, are very wealthy people, mm -hmm. and they are called, I would say, really by all the venture funds of the world. So uh, clearly, when uh, when we, uh, we we started thinking about uh, what we wanted to do, uh, they wanted to invest in in, uh, in healthcare or in biotech in general, but not really uh, knowing at the beginning what we wanted to to do exactly, but the idea was clearly not to recreate something which already existed. So uh, we really wanted to, you know, to innovate uh, in the way innovation is financed. Uh, that's, that was also one of the starting points, I would say. So we looked at different models. Uh, we definitely, we found uh, flagship ventures in the US uh, as a very inspiring uh, source of inspiration for, for us. Uh, and we started developing our own model, so which is based uh, part, partially on AI uh, for the sourcing part. So I think uh, this is an important piece, you know, uh, in our model. 
and also with a goal to, uh, I would say, to invert the, or revert the, the classic way of uh, classic investment mode of uh, of an incubator, which starts from a, a discovery and try to find an, an application. So we wanted to, you know, to start from a, a specific thematics or problematics, and then uh, identify the right people uh, within uh, European. Uh, Academic labs to to work with us on this uh, on this problem. So that was really the the way we 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 started um, and was in twenty early twenty one. So after I would say three months of brainstorming. Yeah. So uh, it was um, an alignment, you know, uh, great people, great opportunity, and then the solution appear as 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 a, as a obvious. Absolutely. Absolutely, and I think the you know the post or COVID or post COVID context also helped us to uh, to 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 come to come to this uh, to this specific model in the mm -hmm. sense that uh, we are uh, in terms of team and the way we are organized, uh, we are decentralized. Uh, we uh, all work at home, uh, and uh, we are ten people today. And uh, the fact is that probably before the crisis, it wouldn't have been possible. So this flexible model that uh, we have today uh, definitely is also the, uh, the result of this uh, specific context and situation, I think. Um, we have a ding, I don't know if it's from... Ah, sorry. Ah, I, thought, I thought it was from my side. Okay. Um, uh you have a fun, you talk about your team you have a fantastic team i already uh, have the opportunity to interview uh, dr serge pamphe uh, michel also uh, your head comes and uh, the following interview we do with chris dr christine thompson fantastic professional so you have a very strong team right now um and you have also uh, a scientific board composed of rock star in science uh, was it difficult to to con contact these these scientists top level scientists and co seduce them and bring them on board on the team maybe uh, so we are uh, we are 10 people today and we are very operational in the sense that really the purpose is to be able to help every day actually the companies that we create and accompany so uh, it's uh, when you look at uh, the, the people in, in the, in the Yorkers team today. So you have a CSO, you have a CBO, uh, you have a person in charge of uh, uh, non-dilutive uh, uh, financing. You have uh, people in charge of IT. Uh, we want to recruit also somebody in IP. So we're able to accompany uh, the, the ventures uh, on any functions uh, that are needed when you when you create uh, uh, something. Uh, looking at the, the SAB, so yeah, I think we had the chance also uh, uh, when really when we started, so in 2020, to, to, to contact these people in, uh, in Europe and in the US through the network. And I have to say that uh, all the people that we contacted, so all the people we wanted to, to have in our SAB accepted, I think uh, they, they found the, the project uh, really great and they, they loved it and, uh, and they are. They are, they are really important, I think, in what we develop and what we do. Uh, they help us not only, I would say, in the long-term vision of uh, what we want to do and the, the, the segments we want to be present in, but also every, every nearly quarter, uh, we discuss with them about the, the different projects that we, we propose to invest in. And so, yeah, they are very instrumental in, uh, in the development of your care. And, we, we wanted to have a good mix of people from the US and Europe, uh, which is the case. Uh, we don't have enough uh, women, I have to say, at this stage, so probably it will change in the future. We have to adjust this, it's very clear. We have a lot of women actually in the team at, uh, at Care. I think it's, uh, it's very important. We insist a lot on uh, diversity and uh, ensure that uh, uh, everybody can be uh, represented. So yeah, that's um, how we do it. Um, and this uh, this SAB, uh, um, I think, is uh, it brings a lot of uh, a lot of ideas, uh, also a lot of uh, I would say uh, ways to uh, to project ourselves uh, in, in the two segments we have uh, we have selected. Yeah. And perfect transition to the two segments because you you are 
focusing on microbiome and synthetic biology. And you talk about this two segment at the very beginning of the idea of Yuri Care. So it was something you are you have already in mind with your with your co-founder. What why these two segments and um, uh, with these two era and uh, and how can I say uh, what what was for you the business potential of these two era and the outcomes for the humankind uh, they promise? Yeah, there are, I think there are different reasons for for this choice of for these two segments. First, I think when we we had a very analytical approach actually yeah. when we looked at the fields in the biotech in the biotech sector where uh, Europe as uh, good research and uh, can really compete with uh, US and, and Chinese labs. I think we, we came to the conclusion that well, well, probably maybe, maybe uh, uh, half a dozen of, uh, of segments uh, that were of interest. Uh, and among them, there were synthetic biology and, and microbiome. And we looked also at segments which are turning points. So where things could happen in the next two, five, 10 years, uh, which will uh, have some impact on the society uh, and which uh, will have also some impacts for, the, for these segments themselves in the sense that if we look at microbiome, for instance, um, you, know, you, you have currently two projects which are in very advanced stage in the US and which could arrive on the market. And we know that if they arrive on the market, so probably within the next 12, 18 months, there will be a lot of big farmers looking at this sector. So there will be a, probably a lot of also many transactions or investments from big farmers, licensing and so on. So this is a turning point. So things, something will happen, we know, in this sector. Uh, and there's a lot of research. Europe is, is very good at it. And also, uh, when we look at the two segments, I think they were complementary. Uh, this is probably more philosophical than, uh, than, than research, but... Uh, I think, you know, microbiome is the way we are uh, integrating in our environment. So it's not only the, the bacteria we've got in the gut or on, on, on the derma, but uh, it's also how we, we, we are uh, connected with uh, our environment. And we, uh, maybe you discussed with Serge about this uh, on different aspects uh, with uh, aerobiomics, with oceanobiomics. So we are linked with, uh, you know, the air, with the water and so on. So, I think from a philosophical point of view, it's interesting. And when you look at SteamBio, it's the way we can also correct or modify from the inside, from the cell, uh, things uh, which are not good uh, and uh, can be mutations, can be uh, also environment, environmental pro problems, can be uh, new materials we want to develop and which are uh, cleaner. So I think you, you, you've got this link between the environment, what is uh, uh, the link between the, the, the humans and, 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 the, and, and its environment, and uh, also the fact that you can modify from the inside uh, things, and these things are you know very complementary, I think, from a, from a philosophical, philosophical point of view. And you've got another lab, by the way, since you can imagine bacteria that you modify also genetically. So, yeah, uh, this came to as as an evidence i think at some point that we had to to be present in these two fields of course i'm, I'm absolutely convinced of that I, I just wanted to ask you the question of of course we, the microbiome is something has will completely change the paradigm of medicine in and not only the medicine but also agriculture and everything in the in the few in the few uh, coming uh, years Um, so uh, we we talk about your strategy and your 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 um, the, the two focus area you you want to, you want to, to commit in. Um, what are your uh, I mean your your financial milestone because we can't we can't talk about deep tech startup and particularly uh, startup studio in deep tech without talking without talking uh, the finance question. Uh, you have raised uh, an impressive uh, amount of money, uh, 60 million euros from private investor, right? Would you yeah, like absolutely. To, yeah. to talk about your fundraising? Yeah, I think uh, one, uh, you know, one of the objectives when we uh, started Eureka was really to, to bring new uh, people around the table. So when I, I, you know, when I was an uh, investment banker before, one of the, the main limitations I observed was the 
the lack of new new investors uh, in, in in Europe in this field in bio, in the biotech field, which is always considered you know as a very technical, difficult, uh, risky. Uh, so that was one of the challenge, and we have been able to, um, I think, with a, a model which is different uh, compared to the, the ones that exist. We have been able to uh, to to raise these funds with uh, a dozen of family offices, which are not from the biotech field. So uh, for for some of them, it was even the, the first time they invested in uh, in tech uh, or in a venture like uh, of, uh, of, of 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 stuff. So I think it's uh, it's interesting. So um, uh, it was it went relatively quickly actually. We did it in uh, in three weeks. Uh, we could have raised more, uh, but there was, I think, the, um, the, the objective to, uh, to, do, to see it as a, as a Series A. So we, we, we see us ourselves as a, as a startup. So we did the Series A with, with the objective to um, create value and uh, raise additional money uh, in, the, in the next couple of months. So we, we did this Series A in May 2021. Mm -hmm. And really, the objective is to raise additional money uh, this year, later this year, I would say in the second part of this year, uh, either through a Series B uh, with uh, probably the similar type of uh, investors, I would say, family offices, or maybe an IPO. That's also something we, we could envisage. And your model is very interesting also because the money is, is in the equity of uh, Euricare. It's not in a fund, you know, to, that's, you, there are some studios who have a, a separate fund that back, you know, their, their venture. Your money is in your equity. That, that, that is very interesting also. So the next round will also be on this model or will, will it be on a separate fund to back your... your oh, it's, it's exactly the same model. I think uh, that was uh, part of the, uh, of the equation at the, at, at the beginning. Uh, when, we, uh, when we looked at it, of course, from a fiscal point of view, uh, it's less interesting for some of the investors. They are shareholders of the, of the holding which invest in, uh, in companies or in projects. Uh, the big advantage is, of course, that we, we, we get a lot of flexibility mm -hmm. thanks to this. We can invest in both projects uh, with biotech studios and companies, mm -hmm. uh, which a fund can, cannot do. So, and of course, also, we don't have any specific uh, horizon uh, for, the, uh, for the investment. So, we are sort of evergreen so which is another big advantage so we've got time we can uh, uh, really uh, make uh, big bets on uh, on some company companies we believe in uh, in, the, in the long run and uh, i think uh, you know we we were inspired by the flagship venture uh, kind of uh, of structure uh, which of course is much much bigger than us uh, but which is, I think, a, a good source of inspiration for, for us in the sense that it has been a, a great success. Uh, they, 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 they made uh, very um, risky bets, uh, but which paid at the end. So that's really the kind of, uh, of route we would have to, to, to have. And for me, uh, having a, probably an institutional investor, a VC on board, would probably change a little bit the spirit that we that we have. Um, maybe we'll do it, but uh, it's not exactly what we want to do. I think continuing with the private in investors as we, as we did in the first round, or an IPO, which is a, a different uh, a different road, or, or opening also uh, additional opportunities is something we, we as I said, uh, we can consider. Yeah. And concerning uh, the way you will invest in uh, seed ventures. You, that you will cook inside uh, Eureka. Uh, how much will you will you will you um, invest per per uh, per startup range? So, yeah, in, in terms of uh, strategy of investment. So just to to remind us, so we invest in very early stage companies, and we invest in late stage companies. So in late stage companies, really the, the goal is to have a rapid, I would say, turnover on the, on these lines between 18 months, 24 months max, mm -hmm. and we invest between one and five million euros per, uh, per company. Looking at the early stage, which is your, your question, so in the biotech studio, for each line, we intend to invest between three and four million euros. Wow. A, time, a period of time of uh, three to four years, 
uh, to reach the proof of concept and then switch to a classic uh, series A. Uh, the Biotech Studio we've got in Belgium now uh, has the, an objective of uh, five to 10 projects uh, to, uh, to, uh, to incubate. Uh, and uh, we, um, we, will, we will raise 10 million euros in this first studio. And we want to replicate this model. So Belgium is, uh, I would say, the first uh, lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will uh, uh, open additional studios uh, with partners in additional countries in the, in the future. Great. Uh, the, the amount you want to commit in the early stage is impressive. And I think it's, it will make a, a clear difference because in the life science and biotech field, um, you know, the, the capitalization at the T0 is very important. It's not like the IT, a uh, high velocity startup, you know, where they can start with a computer and some couple of euros. In the biotech, they need a lot of money and a lot of support, and, and this will make a, a huge difference. And no, I fully agree, I fully agree. And, uh, you know, uh, also what we observe is that uh, many uh, VCs have raised a lot of money and so have... Uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, exited this, uh, this field of, uh, of seeding or pre-series A. And so there's definitely a need uh, that, we, that we can address with, uh, with Uricare. To continue about the fundraising of Uricare, um, you talk about the different options, VC or IPO. There are also now, uh, we see more and more hedge funds committing in the, in the game field of VC, like Tiger Global and all those. What is your impression? Because uh, you are, you have an impressive uh, uh, background in finance. So, what are your, your feeling about this uh, hedge fund committing more in the game field of the, of the early stage uh, VC? Because is it a treat or is it an, an, an opportunity? We know very well this world since uh, our first investor is uh, Alan Howard, uh, who is the founder of Brevan Awards, which is one of the biggest hedge funds in the world. Uh, but looking at direct investment from hedge funds, I think probably can work in, in, some, in some areas, in, in IT, in cryptocurrencies, for instance. I'm a little bit, you know, I, I'm not sure that for long, long investments, uh, like it is the case in biotech, where it takes between five and, and 10 years uh, to, to, uh, to get a success, if everything goes well. Uh, I'm not sure they've got the patience to 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 do that. So um, I, I'm I'm not totally convinced that they will uh, really uh, uh, do the stuff in the in the long run uh, in uh, the biotech field. So that's uh, why we need the structure like uh, ours. I totally agree. Uh, concerning you know investing in one startup uh, is not in there in there because first of all they are too big and but in the United yeah. States. We, we see a, a, a very important move from even in the life science, you know, they come the, the hedge fund and they buy uh, most of uh, they, they see all, all the all the startup in life science who are in the series in clinical trial, you know, and they buy and they buy out everything because they have the capacity, you know, to, to handle the, the yeah, yeah. Excel yeah. of this, 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 these things. Uh, um, you know, the, 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 the financial forecast. No, absolutely. Yeah. And but I think uh, if you look at the U.S. market, uh, uh, we, we, we observe also in the healthcare field, and I think it's the case also in, in other fields, that, uh, that many uh, uh, VCs or private equity firms also have, uh, you know, built their own SPAC mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to invest in, uh, in, in, in the sector with a, a different approach. So I think there's so much cash, I would say, in the system that... Uh, they need to to find uh, any uh, I want to land <laughs> any possibilities to uh, to invest uh, in complement to what we, we already do so yeah but i think in europe it's a little bit different um i'm, I'm not sure i've seen some some hedge funds yeah investing in, in it uh, in crypto but in biotech i'm not sure i haven't seen that mm. yet we we have uh, we have now a good news from the Euronext. Uh, they announced it, uh, recently about uh, they are they are willing to 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 create a Nasdaq like subunit. I don't know how they will structure that, you know, to favor the the IPO of tech comp the European tech company. Um, what what do you think about this announcement? Do you do do you think it's a good news or or let's well, let's wait and see uh, how they will do it. 
I think your next is, uh, is very dynamic. They, they take a lot of initiatives, you know, in the past, they also uh, uh, worked a lot huh, to, to, to constitute the, the network in, uh, in Europe and, and try to convince not only uh, startups and, and tech companies, but uh, mid-cap companies, also private companies to, to come onto the, onto the platform. But, uh, um, you know, all, all these initiatives are, are good. If it can, uh, again, uh, drag additional money to, to tax, it's, it's great. Um, my feeling is that the platform as it, is, it exists today is, is efficient enough. So, uh, of course, there's a lack of liquidity, mm -hmm. but it's more a matter of, uh, of funds, actually, uh, and, and, and probably dedicated funds to the, to the healthcare sector or to the biotech sector in general. Uh, which is the, the main difference compared to the US, where uh, when you make an IPO, I remember uh, the example of Selectis, you know, French company. When we, I was the advisor when we did the, the IPO in France, I think we had a book of maybe uh, 80 or, or 90 institutions, and it was covered, I think if I remember well, it's a long time ago now, but four or five times. Uh, so it was a great success. But when we did the IPO in the US, uh, the, the, the CEO on the told me that you yeah, had something like, I think, 900 institutions in the book. So I think it's a matter of uh, one to 10, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and it's not just because of uh, the technical platform. It's mm -hmm. the main reason is that there are funds, there is cash in this field. People are, are more, more uh, open to, to take risk on the bet, etc. than it is the case in, in Europe. And we come back to what I said before. That's, that's the reason why we, we created Eureka is to bring around the table new kind of investors uh, that uh, at this stage uh, were not present at all in the, in the biotech field. Yeah. You talk about new kind of investor and now you have a new oh, new era of what I don't know if they are investors or speculators with the with the with the um, uh, you know, you know the the coin. Uh, I, 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 I you know I have a brain freeze was. Um, the the crypto on crypto yes crypto sorry <laughs> i don't know what happened to my brain <laughs> oldness <laughs> uh, so uh, we have now a, a new era you know of kind of investor of, of course they are the same but just they use a new tools uh, it's it's just an extension of, of crowdfunding and even equity based crowdfunding which is used you not know, the, the the digital uh, tools uh, do you think that it's come that's that you can also innovate um, on that field and calling you know this kind of investor you know to 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 invest in the equity of your startup or, or in the equity of the or Eureka or, or or maybe yeah like organization of your startup i spent a lot of time myself on um, looking at the, the crypto world and uh, i mentioned uh, alana world before but uh, he's himself very involved in the in the cryptocurrency world he's one of the he's the first investor in coinbase uh, and he has uh, launched his own fund in this field so try to find connections between us. And uh, some, a couple of years ago, I was thinking about, you know, a biotech company which would develop its, uh, its product and uh, people would uh, buy some, uh, some uh, cryptocurrency on it that uh, would give, us, give them access to uh, the product in the future when it runs on the market. I don't know. I think it's the, the problem is the time it takes in the in the healthcare uh, or in the biotech uh, worlds. I think uh, it's it's not adapted uh, to the, the, the short term uh, kind of investment that we, we see in crypto. But uh, that's why I was talking about more more uh, as a speculation. You know, talking yeah. are more you know uh, interested by the, the the excitement of making short term. Uh, you know, uh, so okay. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Rodolf. Uh, it was a great pleasure to have you. Maybe a last word. Would you like to say some word directly to, to the science world, to the PhD student, to the postdoc and scientist who would like you know, to, to join uh, uh, this exciting new era of creating startups? Yeah, but if, if I take again, you know, the, what is the, the motto of, uh, of Eureka is to, uh, if I summarize, is to use... Uh, uh, strategic artificial intelligence huh, to uh, mobilize the, the, hopefully the brightest scientists in Europe, UK, uh, Israel as well, and to, to launch uh, with, uh, with them highly ambitious, impactful uh, startup for the world. So it's very ambitious. 
Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, we are looking at people who have uh, disruptive ideas, uh, who people who want to change the world, uh, who, are, who like entrepreneurship. So all of them, they can join us. <laughs> We're happy mm -hmm. to, to welcome, uh, welcome them uh, in the two fields who are interested in, so in uh, microbiome and synthetic biology. Thank you so much. I completely uh, agree that uh, Eureka will be a great player in the field. The, the model is very, very sexy and, and uh, the, the people you hired are amazing. And I think uh, you will be a major player in Europe and in the world. And the impact will be in the world because innovation of life science is something great. Uh, maybe a recommendation from you. And this is for my personal, you know, I, I always like to ask my great uh, guests if they have some, a book or something to, to recommend me because they make me better, you know. So uh, do you have something to recommend for me to, to become a better person <laughs> or a leader like you? Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, in the, in the current context, probably we have to, to come back to... Uh, Uh, to, to the, the books of reference in the, in the field of war, which also is, is useful, I think, for the management of any conflict. So I have two books of reference. I have not read them uh, recently. I read them a long time ago, but uh, I think they, 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 are still, uh, they are still interesting in the, in the lessons that we can, uh, we can draw from them. So it's, of course, uh, close lists uh, on war, huh, the, which is a major uh, work, I think, uh, which um, I think is, again, is a good source of inspiration to manage uh, any conflict situations. Uh, and notably to, to understand, I think, uh, uh, the, I would say, the, the asymmetric, asymmetrical relationship between uh, attack and defense. And also, I think, which uh, shows that you always need to analyze, of course, the deep and real cause of the conflict huh, to, to be sure that you find uh, an acceptable outcome for, for all the parties. And uh, uh, the second book, of course, which is always uh, attached to the first one is uh, the Sun Tzu. Mm. Um, I think it's Art of War in uh, English, uh, which is also another book of reference I, I read a long time ago. And uh, which I think is interesting. It shows that uh, any, um, uh, any, uh, any victory is psychological first. Uh, and all the rest is accessory. So uh, I think it's, it's true for war, it's true for any conflict. So we should keep that in mind very often. I will, I will add the, the reference uh, in, the, in the blog article. Thank you so much for being my guest. It was a real pleasure to have you. Thank you, Ari.